So good morning. Uh, this is the House Health Care Committee on oh, Thursday, April 15th, which would be tax day, but <laughs> uh, some of us would be scrambling around. But I think it's been deferred at least a few more weeks. So good morning. It's uh, nine o'clock on April 15th. And this morning we have with us uh, invited Ina Bacchus, who's the director of healthcare reform for the state, and want to have her give us an opportunity to uh, give her an opportunity to update us on the where we are in terms of the reset reboot around the uh, ACO. Also, also about where we are in the process of the all payer model moving forward and potential and the negotiations that would be uh, coming up and, and frankly to allow time for questions to create, create an opportunity for committee members to ask questions. Uh, uh, also, uh, I think it'd be important for us if, if Ina has the, the, has, is able to share more with us about where we are in terms of the federal scene and uh, where we are in terms of what might emerge at least, you know, what indications there are that have been communicated uh, around changes at the federal level that would uh, help inform us as we think about moving forward with initiatives in Vermont. And uh, later this morning, we will hear from Vicki Lohner from One Care. Again, I've asked her to do a brief presentation uh, so that there's time for questions. It won't uh, be all the time that we probably would want. But we will. This is a, these are these are issues which are ongoing issues and uh, will require uh, multiple opportunities for us to hear as well as ask questions. So with that, uh, Ina, I see you are on the screen, and uh, there are others with you. If oh, there you are. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, still getting used to people popping around the screen. Uh, so good morning, welcome. And uh, uh, you've met everyone, but I welcome you to introduce yourself for those who may be listening for the first time on uh, this recording. And I'm gonna turn it over to you to um, address some of the broad questions which I just uh, put forward. I think that's what you're prepared to do and then to answer questions. Thank you and good morning, everyone. It's good to see you virtually for the record. <laughs> My name is Ina Bacchus. I'm the Director of Healthcare Reform at the Agency of Human Services. I did prepare a few slides uh, to help us today in talking about this topic. And if I am allowed to share my screen, I'm happy to do that and be the, um, the driver. Okay, I think Colleen can arrange that. Thank you. That to share. Thank you. you know, I should say that I, 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 I've said to Ina that we, we are different ones of us are at different points in our knowledge base around these issues. So uh, it's some of what I've asked Ina to kind of keep that in mind as, as some of this, as we, she does some presentations. So some of it may seem too basic or it may seem too complex. So that's that's the range of that's the range of what I think we're we're dealing with here. So, uh, but I welcome. I'm going to turn it over again to Ina. Thank you. Uh, if you can go full screen, that would be great. Then we can. Uh, it's not quite full screen yet. How's there that? Great. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again for having me to discuss the topic of the all-payer accountable care organization model implementation in Vermont. I will start by reviewing what type of a healthcare reform project the all-payer accountable care organization model is and what kind of a healthcare reform initiative it is not, especially as we are seeing some initiatives that um, are at the federal level right now, such as the subsidies that have been increased um, through ARPA, 
which are really um, probably which are really likely to contribute um, to healthcare coverage and are really focused as healthcare coverage initiatives. Um, whereas the all payer ACO model agreement is focused on payment reform, meaning paying providers differently in the interest of curbing healthcare cost growth and delivering care differently, both to improve quality uh, and population health outcomes, as well as through changing the delivery of care um, to be more efficient and to uh, provide for the most appropriate services in the least cost settings. We have a fee-for-service system, as we've talked about before, um, in this country and in the state of Vermont, healthcare services are largely reimbursed through the fee-for-service methodology that has been the predominant uh, methodology for healthcare reimbursement um, for the, the, along the, the same period of time that we've had large-scale healthcare coverage programs like Medicare, Medicaid, as well as commercial coverage. Fee-for-service rewards uh, the provision of each and every additional service with re without regard uh, to the quality of those services being delivered or to the ultimate outcomes um, related to that service delivery. And that's why um, we, through this model, uh, through this health reform approach, the state of Vermont is endeavoring to pay providers differently in order to drive that transformation in the delivery system, which will lead to better outcomes um, in terms of health. And again, we are seeking to curb the growth in, in healthcare costs through this model. I think I, I, I may have just uh, pre uh, previewed my own next slide and I apologize. Um, how do we, how do we address healthcare spending growth through this model? Really, the, the, the root of the payment change is rather than to pay for each and every additional service, we're really, we can distill the approach of this model to setting a budget for the healthcare system instead of paying for each and every service, regardless of the quality or outcomes. And really importantly, ensuring that that budget is tied to the quality of care that's delivered and the improved, improved health outcomes, and that payments are calibrated based on the quality of care and improved health outcomes. That they're, it's not just a budget, no matter what, uh, no matter if you um, uh, don't provide the, the most appropriate services at the most appropriate time, you get paid no matter what. It's really looking at whether or not the healthcare system is is high quality and functioning in a value-based model. And by value, that really means um, the quality of care that's delivered um, for, for uh, within, a, within a more reasonable cost growth trajectory. I wanted to point out where we are in implementation of the all payer ACO model agreement. And this is important because we do, and I will discuss an imp implementation improvement plan. We have through the performance period in this agreement seen very clearly that there are areas of the agreement um, that we need to improve our performance in, in order to maximize um, our, our performance at the end of the day in this model. Um, the model was agreed to with our partners in the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation in uh, 2016. And after that agreement was signed, a performance year zero was initiated to allow for the uh, system to prepare for transitioning to larger scale value-based payment arrangements. The Department of Vermont Health Access, however, offered its fixed perspective payment model in 2017 um, for participating ACOs and OneCare Vermont was a successful bidder 
on that offering. And we'll talk a, a, a little later on um, about the RFP that Medicaid has issued, Vermont Department of Vermont Health Access has issued um, an RFP to solicit bids from ACOs for a next um, ACO or ACOs based contract. Um, per, then, then we have performance years one. So when our performance in the agreement starts to be measured is performance year one is 2018. And we are now in performance year for 2021. And there is one additional performance year in our contract with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation was created by the Affordable Care Act. It is a, it is provided for um, as a, as an innovation engine for the country to promote different uh, payment models uh, to promote healthcare reform that can ultimately be uh, broadly applicable across states. However, the Innovation Center is testing and has been testing multiple different models, um, just, just more than 50 models they have tested um, in the Innovation Center. And some of those models like Vermont's um, are more custom in nature Vermont is one of three states that has a partnership with the Innovation Center for a truly custom arrangement. Maryland has a partnership as well as Pennsylvania has an agreement with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation was created by the ACA as again, an innovation engine in the interest of improving healthcare quality, but also in the interest of developing models that would moderate healthcare cost growth and could be applied again um, uh, across the nation as they were developed and tested. And what we see coming out of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation does include the Medicare ACO program and, the, and, and various versions of ACO models uh, for Medicare. And there are many, many states with active Medicare and other payer ACO models. In Vermont, to change payment most effectively and to align the incentives for providers to change their business model. We and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation agreed that the likelihood of success would be stronger if the major payers of healthcare were aligned in that payment change, meaning Medicare wasn't coming into Vermont as the only payer that was changing payment. Instead, Medicare said, we'll work with you, Vermont, on your custom model, as long as you also guarantee the participation of Medicaid in paying differently, and you do everything in your power to, uh, to invite the participation of commercial payers in participating uh, and paying differently. So, so again- can I just step in and say, I'm sorry. Um, so I see there's a question. I wanted to just check in and see whether we could take questions along the way or whether we, if there's a natural pause and we'll take questions, what's your? I'm happy to take questions along the way. Okay, well then I'm gonna to turn to Representative Burroughs who has raised her hand with a question. And I don't wanna throw you off track though, you know, so that's, okay. Thank you for my question. I, I am glad you're allowing me to answer, ask the question now because I wouldn't possibly remember it by the end. And, but it is, it pertains to what you're talking about right now. And that is, um, uh, does the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation allow its participants to view the specific plans of other states or do you just get uh, generalized information uh, certainly, we we through the center the center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation um, 
it has a uh, very public information about the models that it's testing. Um, we certainly spent a lot of time talking with them because Maryland had an all payer model pr prior to Vermont. We did learn from some of Maryland's experience in crafting our all payer model agreement here in Vermont with, with CMMI. So CMMI shared about their experience with Maryland and we also reached out to Maryland directly as a state that had a relationship with CMMI and, and uh, really spent quite a bit of time with them uh, to try to learn from their experience and, and, and craft our model in a way that was responsive to what we were learning from them. So certainly there is um, an opportunity for learning and the sharing of information about the different models, most definitely. And and you are allowed to, uh, or you have access to specific um, uh, um, I think I'm blanking on the right terminology, <laughs> wins and losses, the specific um, <laughs> shortfalls and and uh, negative outcomes as well as positive ones from from the various states. Yeah, the. Um, this, the center does make public the results of the of the models and the evaluations that are included with the model, um, and those are all available publicly to us. And certainly, if we if we have questions about any specific um, aspect, it's been very it's been it's been very productive to have such an excellent team at CMS that's willing to connect um, us and our team to different parts of CMS or to different model leads um, on a different model, for, for instance, for our teams to try to um, better understand how things are operating in Vermont, what we might do to modify operations to improve, um, one such example, and this isn't related directly to a, to a model, though somewhat, is um, how critical access hospitals that have current reporting requirements for Medicare can participate. And those reporting requirements are based on, on their fee for service reimbursement. But when they're participating in the Vermont model, they are not in a fee for service model um, as as is typical, and so they need assistance in in how they can satisfy their reporting requirements, given that they're in this innovative payment arrangement. That's a place where we've been working with CMS, and we're hoping that CMS, our partners, will will issue some formal guidance to them. But they've been able to connect us with other parts of of CMS that have work on that area, as well as folks who are thinking about payment models for critical access hospitals. So. Thank you. Thank you, Ina. Uh, I, I see Representative Peterson has a question before that. I wanna, I wanna just touch on something you said, and this is pretty basic, but I think it, for, I just find it's probably useful because it has to do with language and what that, what that leads people to conclude. So you were just talking about the one of the key parts of the model is that Medicare and Medicaid would work to align, or that this model allows and expects Vermont to align uh, payments, plan, payment reform with Medicare and Medicaid and to work to include commercial payers as well as, as much as possible. And those are the, those are the, payers in the all payer model language is that what it's referring to so as opposed to and, and i think it's sometimes still in the public eye gets confused with people say well i'm you know i i'm for the single payer model not the all payer model and and conflating different language pieces is that is that so the all payer refers to the fact that this is payment reform aligning Medicare, Medicaid, and hopefully commercial to the degree possible, meaning those major payers. As we remember that very helpful pie chart, which we've just recently revisited in committee again, 
if you look at Medicaid, Medicare, and uh, the commercial insurance market, that's 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 the world of uh, payment for health insurance in this current era that we're in. So I, I'm I'm asking a question, but making a statement. Maybe you can help comment on that. Your your statement is accurate. The the terminology all payer really really refers to the three major payer types that are covering Vermonters um, that are that cover Vermonters for for healthcare services and aligning those three major major payer types in paying differently for healthcare services so that providers aren't aren't as much and. And this is a place where improvement does need to be made. We need more, we need to see providers move more of their revenue to risk-based models and to, and to revenue models where they have a fixed payment that they can rely on that is predictable and stable and that they can operate from in that, in that idea that the healthcare system should have a budget um, within which to work and to best uh, operationalize and provide for the care and needs of, of Vermonters. And so the idea being that if, if the healthcare system only has a budget for Medicaid, uh, that then the healthcare system is still working under the fee for service incentive for the other reimbursement that, that it's receiving and the incentive is not as strong to transform the, the delivery model and to do and to deliver care differently um, within the budget versus delivering care in a system that rewards for each and every additional uh, procedure or act, activity. Um, the, and, and having those payer types aligned in providing that different and more flexible payment is also important so that providers are being paid for their time in, in doing activities that the fee-for-service system does not reward. And so the fee-for-service for system is transactional and you, you go in for a particular service and and your healthcare provider is reimbursed for delivering that service. But if the healthcare provider needs to pick up the phone and talk with other providers about the best way to deliver that service or to coordinate about the next step in your care plan with other healthcare providers, those activities are ones that are not reimbursed by fee-for-service. Um, those those coordination activities are a key example of, of something that's not enough of a widget to be able to, to fall into the fee-for-service reimbursement category. And we wanna provide healthcare, the healthcare system with the dollars that they need to enable the time uh, that's required in those sorts of activities that really do have um, a really important impact on health and outcomes for patients. Thank you, and and I don't want to kind of overbeat this issue. And then I want to turn to Representative Peterson, who has a question. But so that what you've been describing is the alignment of the major payers: Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial insurance. And that's the all payer terminology. Single payer, I think, is helpful. Your first slide, which showed the one, two, three, four of healthcare financing, healthcare coverage, payment reform, and delivery system reform. Yes the quote single payer terminology really falls within number one, which is a healthcare financing model, not a, a payment reform model. Is that fair to say? I think, I or, think single, single payer means different things to different, different okay. people. It certainly could fall into the health care financing model. It could also fall into the healthcare coverage um, uh, realm as well. That, yes. Okay, <laughs> maybe I'm making things more confused than helpful. Um, but I just, I just find myself uh, that the, the terminology, the language 
is I think sometimes not helpful in these two distinctions that uh, that have been used in the public eye uh, for many years now. And, and it, it, I think it adds to some confusion at times. So thank I, you. I agree with I agree with you that when we use the the payer terminology, it seems like one is a substitute for the other, but they are very different things. Yeah, that's I guess that's the point I was trying to reach. Representative Peterson, I kept you waiting, but yeah, you've at least one question at this point, I imagine. No, that that's that's fine, Cherry. I really appreciate your question because I just learned something about what all payer really meant. I you know I'm at as a new person in this, I'm still struggling to understand some of this. And that's going to lead to the question I have. And I've heard it since I've we've started this, these discussions, um, fee for service versus fee for health, I guess I would call it, a, and overall a health quotient that you want to get to. I just have such a hard time understanding how you would pay a healthcare provider for my health uh, versus paying him or her, in, in my case, when I go in for a checkup or go in for a consultation um, and then get referred to a test or get referred to someone else or have a yearly exam of the various types that I have. Um, I, 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 I struggle with what you mean when you say payment for for health versus uh, uh, a payment for fee, uh, a fee schedule, fee for service. I'm looking at the words here. Um, I really struggle with that. And, and it sounds like it's what we're trying to get to and maybe are at, but I, I just, I, I wonder how it affects insurance and health providers um, do they get different amounts of money? Do they, do they make less under this system? Do they make more? Do they like it? Or I, I, I wonder how it affects the system. And I, I've never understood how you pay somebody for my health. Maybe you could help me. <laughs> I, I'll, there are a couple of uh, very good questions embedded in, in, your, in your overall question. And I'll first talk about how you, and, 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 and also say that we have some really good resources in the Department of Vermont Health Access that could go into real depth and detail with you about how the budget is developed, because I think it's a very good question. Well, where do you, how do you know how much uh, healthcare providers need uh, in order to operate business, be open and have their, their doors open to provide care for individuals? How do you understand what, what is required for that? And there's been a lot of work in developing um, what we refer to as, as value-based payments, which can have components. The value-based payment can have a, a fixed component too, so that, that budget within it. Um, but that value-based payment, it, it is looking back at what healthcare looks like historically, patterns of utilization uh, for patients historically. So it, it does take into consideration, these are generally what the patients in our panel um, require in terms of healthcare services. And based on bundling up all of those requirements, then a reasonable uh, then a reasonable budget can be set. I think there's that that is the most uh, grossly overgeneralized description of that that uh, I think is imaginable, and there is a lot of devil in the details to that. It the the generation of the of the budget or of the benchmark um, for what the healthcare providers. Um, are, are ultimately held to is, is, it, it is a pretty scientific uh, process and there, is, and there is also some risk in that, imagining um, a situation like the, uh, the global health pandemic that we're experiencing, that certainly throws off our expectations for what health, healthcare services uh, look like. So there are, there are um, it's, it's by no means a, 
But that's a good that's a good answer, uh, Ina. Thank you for that. And, and I, I assume that will that changes with with your sex, with your age, with your you if you bundle those things that are required to keep you know I'm 69 to keep a 69 year old man healthy. Uh, that as time goes on, well, in my case, those numbers will go down. I hope. No, I'm kidding. Uh, they probably go up as you as you age and, and things change. So is is that does that come into it? Your your demographics obviously must. Absolutely, that's factored in. A good example uh, is in the Medicaid program when we think about how the the we call it rate development. Um, the team calls it rate development. Um, those rates tend to look quite a, quite different for children than for adults. And you can imagine that's because children um, are, are in most cases uh, much healthier than adults do not have in most cases, this is not in all cases, of course, but uh, children as a, as a general group don't have the, the prevalence of chronic disease, for instance, that we see with the adult population. So that's absolutely right that beneath that, those things are all taken into consideration. They're factored in. Okay, I have many more questions, but we won't have them now, thank you. Well, can, I, can I just say that I think these are the kinds of questions that really are important to ask because uh, even for folks who are who've been around for a while, it's like some of these, there, there's, there's, there's many issues that there are to really understand. And I would just say, uh, Representative Peterson, I think you may have just coined a phrase that I found useful when you said, well, as opposed to fee for service, fee for health, uh, it kind of captures something in a way that uh, makes the, the two, uh, when we say, value, we're talking about value-based payments, which I think is what you're, I think that would be, and I'm gonna look to Ina now, that's, what, that's the phrase that's used in the jargon of this world right now to contrast it to fee for service. But you know, in some ways, fee for service versus fee for health kind of captures it somewhat more clearly in my mind. And so you may have just coined a phrase. So I think, I think it captured the idea. Uh, represent, uh, so I'm gonna go turn to Representative Page and we, we will have more, give you a more chance to present and also ask more questions. So Representative Page. Uh, yes. Um, you know, our um, our health care in Vermont is very difficult in it to understand for for anybody, including members of this legislature, or this this body. And it kind of reminds me of Winston Churchill's uh, comment, um, uh, where he said it was a riddle wrapped in an enigma, um, talking about um, uh, the former Soviet Union. Um, and I kind of look at our healthcare system in, in that way uh, sometimes. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at your slide here and I see payment reform, curb healthcare cost growth, delivery system reform, improved quality and population health. And I have to ask, I mean, our healthcare costs continue to go up. I'm not certain that our quality, um, of healthcare is, is has really improved that much. Can you could you explain that, or tell me why I'm wrong in 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 such an assessment? And then I'd like to go back to the previous slide, um, where you talk where you have the uh, um, where um, well, we'll just talk about this slide right now. I don't think that your assessment is incorrect, and that is why we are why we are in this program of healthcare reform. Um, healthcare cost growth it is is not has not been on a sustainable trajectory. Healthcare quality uh, should always be a focus of continuous improvement, but in particular, um, healthcare. Healthcare quality uh, in recent years, there are some there are some um, key areas where where we need to see improvement. As far as the all payer model as a reform initiative, um, 
going back to the timeline slide now, um, we are in performance year four. We have had uh, two complete performance years, one and two, um, with there being over that time, as anticipated, a growing scale of participation in the model. And I'll talk more about this as an impetus for our improvement plan. We have not reached the scale of participation in this model that's necessary to uh, really tip the balance in terms of a, a revenue change for providers and for the system. So do we know when we're gonna change that? You know, are we just going to, um, you know, give, uh, have another five years and, and, and be basically where we are now? At what point do you think we're gonna see, um, you know, some- The change. Some improve, improvements, yes. One one of the one of the things that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation has observed about the models that it's tested um, and is testing is that when those when those models have voluntary components, it's hard to set it's hard to set a, a deadline for or it's hard to set a, a mark draw a clear mark for a conversion to a different revenue model. I think there's um, the question was asked earlier about where CMS is headed. I think there's reason to believe that the CMS might be headed for some more mandatory um, payment change, where payment change is it's not a voluntary um, change to a new revenue model. Medicare will only pay, for instance, in a new way. Medicare is only willing to reimburse providers that will accept that change revenue model. And that gets to your question about when will the balance be tipped? I think that there's, um, that there's a, a balance to strike um, for providers in terms of their readiness to participate in these, in these new models. And at the same time, I think that as the federal government continues to drive harder on on changing the way that healthcare is paid for, that we may see the balance start to tip more in that direction. I don't think it's, it's reasonable that we would see this overnight change. Going back to how many years we have in the fee-for-service system, um, the, the ways that the, that the system is structured around the fee-for-service reimbursement and the readiness of, of healthcare providers to assume financial risk, right? That ha giving, having to manage a budget means you're, you're at risk if you don't manage well within your budget. And the ability of providers to manage financial risk and the readiness of providers to, to manage financial risk certainly does vary by different provider types and provider size. We need to be focused on how more providers become ready to assume risk and can take risk. Um, and that, that's an important piece to drive more, more revenue towards, towards, that, uh, towards the new model of, of budget. But there, there's also a glide path that can be created where providers incrementally assume more risk, where providers have, have, are at risk for um, some portion of their performance, but not fully at risk um, in the direction that we would like we would like to see. I think it's it's reasonable to consider um, that it's reasonable, you know, to consider looking at at um, timelines for for risk assumption. Okay. Um and if I may, Chair, I have one more question regarding this slide. Sure. Um, everything I read about uh, the governor and Secretary Smith, it looks like um, we're going to continue on after 2022 with a with an agreement, I believe, with One Care. Is that correct? First of all, and one of the, one of the things I wanted to say 
and meant to say earlier is we, ha we have an agreement between the state of Vermont and the federal government that allows the state of Vermont to, to customize how Medicare works in the state. Our agreement is an ACO model agreement, but our agreement is not a contract with One Care Vermont. We, um, through this agreement, offer, offer that ACOs in Vermont can be paid differently and there's no prohibition on other ACOs uh, operating in the state of Vermont. We the only ACO, have, we only have the one, AC one care. There, there is highly, one. Highly unlikely we're gonna get another or others. There is one ACO operating in the state of Vermont today and that is also the ACO also has to be an attest to uh, join the state of Vermont in this model uh, to work with the state of Vermont towards the model goals and that ACO is One Care Vermont. We are the the agreement that we have with Medicare does allow for the state to have a custom Medicare program which I think again we're one of just three states that has that um, that considerable flexibility with the Medicare program. Medicare is an, is an essential participant in healthcare reform. As the chair mentioned, it's, it's about a third of the healthcare coverage in the state. If we're trying to do something that's consistent across the payer types, and that is consistent for Vermonters across the lifespan, there's no way that we can do that without Medicare's participation. But Medicare is a very large program and can be a very blunt instrument for a small state like Vermont. Medicare may make mandatory certain aspects of, of its portfolio of paying differently, and that may not work well for Vermont. Right now, with an agreement with Medicare, we have the opportunity to shape how Medicare programs uh, could work in the state of Vermont that might be a, that might much better serve us, a very small state um, with a unique, you know, with a unique uh, rural makeup. Um, it, I think that um, having a Medicare agreement is an, a very important part of our healthcare reform portfolio. What that looks like though for the future, we need to engage in a public process to solicit feedback. We need to look very carefully at what is working in this current agreement and what is not working. One of the things that we know is not working the way that we would like it to is in fact how Medicare is paying ACOs in Vermont. We'd like Medicare to pay ACOs in Vermont more like how Medicaid has developed the payment model. That's something that CMS, our partners have signaled that they're willing, there's certainly, they, they, they can consider whether or not we can change that. But I wouldn't say that we are, are signing the dotted line on a next agreement without going through the negotiation process to determine what we can walk away with as a state, and even more importantly, without um, completing that public process that we are going to be launching in the spring summer time, possibly co consistent with the, the ending of the legislative session. Thank you very much, Ina. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I, I, there's, there's some kind of feedback, well, I guess it's not there now. Um, so again, uh, I think we're, was Representative Goldman, were you in the queue first or Representative Black? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk about providers um, being able to assume more risk because that's kind of a conceptual term and I'm not sure people understand what that would mean in a real world example. I can, I... Yes, I can. I can give it my best shot, and then it, it is it is technical uh, and different for different providers, certainly. And and it, it might be a question you would also ask One Care Vermont as it is developing 
risk models and has risk models um, where providers are at risk. But essentially what I mean by that is that a provider has to have um, a healthy enough balance sheet and the ability to manage in a scenario where if the spending goes over budget and the provider is accountable for that spending over budget, that that can be um, absorbed, so to speak, in the, in the provider's overall financial picture. Um, some providers also may not have uh, the ability um, yet to, to be able to work with an alternative payment um, that's different than fee-for-service. There's there is a mix of, of provider readiness and provider um, ability to manage within a risk structure. And that's another, um, that's another reason for uh, potentially providers to be working together in a, a risk bearing construct because of the different uh, degrees of financial, um, of, of financial backing uh, within that within that construct, right right now, and um, I think this is something to explore further with One Care Vermont, so they can talk to you about their delegated risk model and how they work with providers. But another important point to make is that with the Medicaid program, the Medicare program, and the commercial program, the risk contract is between the payer and the ACO. So there is one risk contract, Medicaid contracts with the ACO and the ACO is at risk. And, and then if the performance of the overall network of the ACO um, is, is better or worse than expected, either the ACO is able to um, generate savings and distribute those savings across its network or the ACO needs to um, needs is is accountable to pay back for that risk. And I have another slide which I can explain that with the Medicaid program. But it is important to know that at the high level, these alternative payment contracts between Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial payers are payer ACO contracts. So if I may follow up, so yikes, if I understand this right, um, the, um, the risk is to, oh, never mind. Go ahead. We'll come back. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand because what I what I recall was that you didn't have scale, you didn't reach scale on the provider involvement, although I understand that most of your involvement is through the UVM practices. And I was just wondering how this risk possibility and exposure is affecting practices in participation. It the risk, the risk exposure does affect participation. And I'll give an example of that. Um one of the and, and it was a recommendation for improving in the uh, in the performance in the agreement, in particular in light of COVID nineteen and its impact on the financial health of of Vermonters, of and Vermont providers and Vermonters. Um, when when you're at risk as an entity at risk, you need to have money in reserve to manage that risk in the case that in the case that you don't perform um, that you don't have a good performance we for medicare uh, the risk the risk uh, corridors previously were 5% risk corridors and that risk corridor meant that the aco ultimately was was liable for more risk but then it was contracting with providers to share in that risk. And it, and again, the ACO, um, One Care Vermont, I think will be better suited to describe to you exactly how their risk model works. But we know that the risk that was delegated for hospital participation was making it difficult for, uh, for, hospitals, for hospitals to uh, participate based on, on, on their financial situations. 
we modified the Medicare risk corridor so that the risk was not as significant for 2021. Um, we worked with our partners at CMS to do that. We did that in light of um, the experience in the pandemic. And we saw a provider come into the model that had not been able to participate in the Medicare program previously. Um, a provider came into the model um, with that new risk structure in place. That provider may have uh, been able to come in, and this is a hospital, Rutland, Hospi uh, Rutland Regional Medical Center. Rutland Regional Medical Center may have been able to come in, you know, more slowly over, over time, but I think particularly in 2021, this performance year, performance year four, after a, what I would say is a near complete disruption in 2020 with a certainly a destabilizing impact on healthcare finances, that risk corridor modification made it possible for, for Rutland Regional Medical Center to join this model in the, in the 2021 performance year, even, even as things um, have been very much disrupted in terms of the financial picture. Representative Black and then Representative Donahue. Uh, I realize we, but I, I realize we're we haven't gotten through you know, this presentation, but I think I think these questions are important for us to be able to put forward. So we'll we'll kind of keep juggling back and forth if if that's okay. Well, I have lots of questions, but I'll save them till the end. My my oh. one question is that is Medicare paying us for this? The state. Are we getting no. money from Medicare to roll out this model, this initiative? Medicare does not pay does not pay the state to roll out this initiative. Um, there was one year of startup funding in year zero. Um, that startup funding was not for the state; rather, it, it was it was to um, it was to sustain the funding that Medicare had been providing for the Blueprint for Health and for the SASH program previously through a different Medicare demonstration, which was called the multi-advanced uh, pra multi practice um, medical home demonstration. I think I, I, think I, I kind of, um, uh, that's not quite, I don't have that name quite right, but it was the MAPCP demonstration. Um, so performance year zero, Medicare did provide the state of Vermont with the funds to keep funding for Blueprint and, and SASH in that year. And those funds did come directly to Vermont as the, um, as the administrator of the Blueprint program and then were distributed to SASH. Those funds now come to the state of Vermont. They come through the state of Vermont as a modified um, total cost of care. They come into the state of Vermont, but they only come in through the ACO. They don't come to the state as an entity. So we're no, longer, we're no longer getting money for Blueprint and SASH, but the money for getting it to, to the ACO to replace it. The money for Blueprint and SASH never came to the state of Vermont previously in the demonstration. It went directly to providers from Medicare. We had one year where it didn't go directly to providers because the providers weren't, the, the, the One Care Vermont was not set up in a relationship with Medicare in order to um, receive that money and distribute it to the Blueprint for Health and SASH. But very importantly, the demonstration that I spoke of that was providing Medicare participation was was canceled. It was a discontinued demonstration. There was no other path for the Medicare dollars to be available for Blueprint and SASH um, at the end of 2016. That demonstration was um, sunset, put to bed, um, and was not uh, maintained. And, and in part, that was not a, a demonstration that was sustained because um, there were not enough or significant savings demonstrated through it, um, with the exception of, of Vermont, which was demonstrating savings. However, Vermont, as, 
as one small state wasn't wasn't able to offset all the savings that weren't being demonstrated in where the demonstration was happening in other states. Okay, I guess I'm just trying to really get at what do we stand to lose if we discontinue this after 2022? We, if we discon, the, it, our relationship with Medicare is very important in terms of having an aligned, uh, the ability to align reform initiatives across the payer types to make them as uniform as possible because, and, and the administrative burden is, is a key aspect here that also drove um, this initiative um, certainly knowing that there are different sets of rules and requirements and payment uh, mechanisms and, and programs across the three major payer types was, was a piece of information that through this model um, we were trying to address. So we lose, we lose that opportunity for Medicare um, to participate in, in Vermont-based reform. Um, that's that's one piece. We also lose that Medicare participation um, in Blueprint. View the dollars that flow from Medicare for Blueprint and and Sash is another piece that would be lost. Um, those are things that. Okay, and that's what funds the community health teams, right? The CHC. The Medicaid. Yep, the Medicare portion. Those teams are also funded by Medicaid and commercial payers. So that's a, that is a that is a multi-payer program as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm going to. So we've been. Uh, Ian has been uh, helping us nonstop for close to an hour, and I'm going to have Representative Donahue ask a question. Then I'm going to suggest we take a five-minute stretch, off-screen break for everybody to be able to just. Uh, get a break and then we'll come back and continue and uh hope and then likely take another break before we switch to hearing from one care but representative donahue uh, thank you although my first question was uh, if, if we're going to drill down or you know if you're going to drill down a little bit more on uh, medicaid uh financial risks and issues in a later slide i'll hold off but if not i can ask now I don't, I don't want to jump ahead of your slides if, if it's going to be uh, a later discussion. I was going to, as, as you know, we haven't seen the performance in the model that the performance in the model needs to be improved. We've recognized areas for improvement with One Care Vermont, uh, improvement with the state of Vermont and how we approach the model. There are areas where we want to work with our federal partners to improve as well and ensure that the Green Mountain Care Board's regulatory activities are supporting the model. When we made, when we made recommendations about how to improve, some of those recommendations were really informed by the scale of participation in the Medicaid program. And that's what I was going to talk a bit more about is the performance in the Medicaid program and what we've seen in that program that does have a more advanced alternative payment model, mean, meaning it's, it does have a truly fixed component of the payment model. We really we looked at, at Medicaid as, as a program offering to understand, well, so we're seeing more participation in Medicaid. So what's working about Medicaid? And then how could we take what's working in Medicaid and recommend that we, that we pursue those approaches through the other participating payers. Um, and so Medicaid, you can see the scale of participation is greater in the Medicaid program as well. I was, I was going to highlight um, how, how a few key um, outcomes of the Medicare, excuse me, the Medicaid contract with, with OneCare, I have to just move you down on my screen so I can be able to read um, how that's working. So I, di I did want to highlight a few things about the DIVA Department of Vermont Health Access, which is the uh, operates um, Medicaid program. 
is working with OneCare. In 2019, Diva and OneCare agreed on the price of healthcare upfront and actual spending was more than expected. So for Diva and OneCare, that actual expen spending being more than expected, OneCare was taking that risk for the spending. Because OneCare shares financial risk with Medicaid, OneCare has to pay for a portion of the spending over the agreed upon price. And for the 2019 performance year, OneCare Vermont paid approximately 6.7 million to Diva. If Diva and OneCare hadn't had this risk sharing arrangement, then Diva, the Vermont Medicaid program, would have paid the entirety of the spending in excess of the expected price. And we've I, I was only going to add that this is a very, it's a very common liability in a fee-for-service system where you do estimate what you think your fee-for-service spending is going to be. If the fee-for-service spending exceeds that, however, um, the, you know, the, the department pays, pays that. They've paid every, every fee-for-service um, with no sharing of that risk. Okay, my, so my question, I think, steps back a little bit further back from that, um, when the all-payer model was first, um, you know, uh, conceptual and developed, I think one component of it was that Medicaid, part of its commitment was to um, be increasing uh, rates a little bit closer to meeting costs rather than um, underpaying and therefore um, increasing the cost shift. And, you know, from a legislative point of view, it's great when the DIVA budget isn't, you know, skyrocketing because rates are going up. But, but in fact, we haven't increased them. And I think the effect of that is that when there are savings, they increasingly go only to Medicaid, not to commercial payers. Um, and therefore, it, we, we're seeing a real increase in the cost shift, which seems to be uh, connected with the all-payer model and us not increasing our payment, our kind of fair share of the payment for what we're purchasing. Is that? Uh, because, of course, the Green Mountain Care Board can, can look at the whole financial picture, but they can't regulate Medicaid rates. We're the only ones who can do that. So if the cost shift is increasing um, because we're not even keeping pace, let alone um, reducing that gap, which I think was one of the um, sort of agreements on the large scale, um, then we're increasing the cost shift. And that would mean commercial insurers who are the smallest um, participants in terms of that end of the scale would have even less incentive to join because they're not gonna get to share in the savings as much if, if um, the bulk of the savings end up going to Medicaid. The, the Green Mountain Care Board is required we are required as a state to look at how the all-payer model impacts cost shifts. And I don't want to, I don't want to inaccurately represent what we've looked at and would invite Green Mountain Care Board to talk more with you about that analysis. But I do think that the upshot is that the ACO program is not exacerbating the cost shift. The cost shift does exist. Absolutely, but the so ACO my, program itself is not is not making that worse. Okay, that may be something we we should hear from the Green Mountain Care Board because um, I I had heard that it might be making it worse, but that it, it it certainly is not improving it, which had been one of the um, you know um, one component of what we were supposed to be doing as part of our agreement with the federal government. So, all right, thanks, thank you. 
Okay, I, I am going to just, uh, I'm going to take executive charge here and suggest that we take a five minute screen break. Uh, I think give everybody a chance to stretch. Uh, we, we have several hours ahead of us still, and I think that will serve us all well. So I, right now, well, let's say, let's say we'll be back at 1015. That'll give us a little, what, seven? Yeah, a little more than five minutes. Let's be back on this.